So welcome everybody. Thank you for having me here. I'm Claudia. I'm representing the Ladies of US Amsterdam chapter. And it's the first event this year. And it's also the first event uh, we partner up with uh, UX Townstart. And also we have the first time PWC Experience Center as a host. And uh, first I would like to thank everybody who was involved in this event. Um, it was like two weeks ago we didn't have any venue. And uh, of course it was super spontaneous to jump in. Uh, thanks for that. Also our panelists were super spontaneous. So Malika Hans and uh, Cecilia. Thanks to them and also Candice, where are you? Thanks to Candice because she was actually the driving force also behind um, this whole event. And yeah, so we got to jump in uh, in the <coughs> because we have a uh, little time and I don't want to waste some time. So we are going to have um, Nikki is saying something about the Experience Center and um, after that we have the panelists introducing themselves. And after that, we're going to jump in into the discussion. Perfect. Thank you. So, welcome, everybody. Thank you, all. People are not working this time. So, first of all, thank you for being here and spending your Thursday afternoon with us, both physically and the four people that are virtually there, three. Um, <laughs> so, we are super excited to have you at the Experience Center. I think this is goes for, for the whole team. And I already spoke with a few people um, and, and got the question, what are you doing on the UX designers at the Experience Center? So, this is where I would like to start. It's so great when you bring people together and that have interest topics and you create this awesome community of so this is kind of what we are. We are in a national community of creative solvers, that's how we would like to call ourselves. Uh, we have a team of collaborating interns, seeds thinking of theirs. We have that we really need to be aware of. We have a power to decide both what we have to develop and how. And those are both important. Because you may have the best idea for the most good AI application that you can ever think of. I don't know. An application to deliver resources to refugees, right? But how you design, how you develop it, Still important because if you do use the wrong set of data, you may end up perpetuating certain harmful narratives and certain harmful uh, stereotypes. If you do collect personal data, it may be misused by authorities. If you don't communicate well what the application can do, resources may be wasted. So you may say, well, I'm actually just planning to use it, right? Not to build or design one, but the same logic applies. The context where you uh, where you plan to use the AI, the application, the people you're doing it for, the people you're doing it where it matters, it's important. You can outsource a lot of work to AI, but you cannot outsource your critical thing. You cannot outsource your ethics. And that's what responsible design is about. It's about giving you enough tools and practices to question a lot of the practices in business, in product management, in service design that are <coughs> embedded in the way that we do things. Question them, analyze them, and understand how we can do better. I'm very interested to hear from you and from the other panelists about how we can do 
something sensible to that. Huh? <laughs> that was that was really sensible. Um yeah, I'm uh, I need a little bit more to grab to hold on to so I have a couple of slides. Uh, um but um uh, my name is Monique Peter uh, and uh, I'm a researcher and consultant in responsible AI so I'm focusing a little bit on a different angle here and I think it's a nice compl complementary uh, um, skill set. Um, so, um, nowadays, we see that suddenly AI has arrived. It's no longer fiction, it's no longer something that we talk about that might uh, uh, yeah, come at us in the future, it's here, right? Everyone has seen or probably played around with uh, ChatGPT, uh, and um, it's super useful, but it also has a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. So, um, and we see that it had, uh, AI in general, so not just ChatGPT, it has upsides and downsides. And we're not already uh, not, uh, already clear about what these up and downsides are. Even. We're still uh, very much investigating and conducting uh, a lot of research to understand what the ups and downsides are. So it's very difficult to um, guide the development of AI in the right direction. And we ask a lot of people using it and people working with it uh, to still stay vigilant and to kind of recognize when AI is not working for us, but actually misinterpreting, for instance, our um, uh, intentions, or is uh, creating certain side effects that we don't want, or is benefiting some group of people and then uh, actually harming another. Uh, and it's very important that we uh, realize this and that we actively try and discover how these uh, harms and benefits uh, arise and from which user groups uh, they, uh, they arise. Um, currently, a lot of the time people are talking about it as a scale where you have upsides and downsides and you need to balance them and sort of trade-off, but I actually think that you can create additional value for users by performing uh, or using AI in a, in a responsible way. So uh, a responsible AI practice is actually creating additional value. Um, so it's not uh, a trade-off uh, per se, in my opinion. Um, so how can you contribute? What, uh, what does this mean to the extent you ask? Um, well, when you talk about responsible AI as a practice, it's basically, um, uh, yeah, you look at organizational aspects, so you look at policies, you look at uh, checks and balances, and all the things. You look at technology that can support it, so you can think of fairness metrics for explainability. How can I open up the black box of AI so that people can actually understand what's going on? And you look at people, what type of skills do they need, and what type of uh, knowledge do they need, how can we train them, uh, and how can we empower them to actually use AI in a uh, intelligent way, and also be vigilant to these errors that might still occur. Um, well, I think there's, there's kind of, for me at least, <laughs> uh, two very obvious ways in which you might come into this. So the first one is actually in the middle of that technology of people. How can you make sure that AI uh, models and AI behaviors are not just black boxes? Uh, and currently, explainable AI is very much looked at from a data science point of view. So, okay, I'm a data scientist, why is my model behaving in a certain way? And then they use additional statistics and statistical visualizations to understand their own models. But that is really different from a user centered or human centered perspective. On uh, explainable AI. So, if you take a UX stance on that, if you really look at the different stakeholders and what their information needs are, then suddenly it becomes a UX problem. And you can ask many different questions uh, about what type of information should be available to different types of people, not just the developer, but also end users, maybe consumers, data subjects. What do they need to know? And how can you truthfully provide them with that information in uh, uh, yeah, an accessible manner, in a user-friendly manner? Uh, 
Uh, so that to me is one of the first uh, questions that I think is very relevant. And the other one is that also you have professionals might start using AI supported products for design. And then there's a different question that ties into what I talked earlier. What type of information or knowledge or skills do you need to actually be critical? And it also ties into the uh, how can you understand what the limitations or potential biases are when using this type of product? And how can you stay vigilant and also open up discussions about that uh, in a meaningful way without being super um, hesitant to use that, but also not to be like naive and enthusiastic about it? So, how do you find that balance? For me, that is um, responsible yeah, like, yeah, for leads at UX and also everyone else at UX. <laughs> <laughs> I do conversational AI. So I founded a company called Conversation Design Institute. And what we do is so like when come to, when enterprises want to use AI to talk to people, then they come to us and we teach them how to do that. You know, it's pretty interesting about it. like we try to figure out like how do you have a human conversation and how do you, how can be inclusive when you actually do that. Because when we say use AI to talk to people, we we've, we've all talked to the shitty chatbots. I imagine <laughs> that's usually our word or like voice applications or maybe an IPR system we call them on the phone. A lot of those conversations that companies are having are more and more being automated. But then it's like you know language is incredibly powerful because you know we even think in language. So when you start automating these conversations, it's a very big deal. Like if you if you're not inclusive and I respect people's linguistic preferences, you kind of reject your identity. So in Germany there was a case where you have immigrants and they would reach out to the government, they would want to ask a question, but the chatbot didn't understand them because it wasn't really German. Right? And then like boom, you're not part of our society. And that's kind of welcoming message to those people. So there's in a way, like a massive responsibility to think about this more deeply, right? So that's what we try to do, and then we teach people that in our education programs. And some of the very simple things that we try to teach people is like, whenever you create anything, just take five deep breaths and think about who you're creating this for. Because a lot of times, it's just like the user is like the address and statistics, statistics, and what's the problem, and you kind of hack it together, and that's it, right? But it doesn't really work. So in our, we have a whole workflow, and we really focus on uh, doing that very mindfully and, and sort of have a lot of empathy in there. But it's a conversation. A lot of people, when they design a conversation, they just write something down, right? It's actually when we teach people half that conversation, then it's a character. Think about what this conversation might mean for someone. And then we have a whole process there, and it's about you know, having diversity on the team, because the AI is a reflection of the people that create it. You want to make sure they have the rest of their team of the people that create. So there's this whole process from design for AI systems. Uh, yeah, if we don't do that well, then all of a sudden all these new systems are going to take over very quickly. Um, our main message is always that, you know, when an executive says, you know, let's build something with AI, that is great, but be mindful of who you have in the room when you start doing that. Because a lot of times, you know, we just put like a bunch of white guys in a room and they build an AI system and they have no idea who that's going to interact with. So that's really a big message. And I think what's fun for me tonight is that uh, uh, conversational AI is really its own world always and conversation design is its own discipline. But these conversations are now taking place at different modalities, right? They're, they're coming onto the websites and the apps. So all of a sudden, there's this whole world of user experience design that has always been there, and our conversation design is kind of interacting with that more. So for us, it's always also like, how do we make sure that we find sort of an alignment with all these best practices that UX design already have, so that that field of conversation design can kind of mature and it doesn't get overwhelmed by some of the things. You know, if you're just doing the UX design, you apply it to conversational interface, you're going to be okay, but it's not going to be very good, right? So how do we make sure that we get a fair at the table with traditional UX design? 
so that we can kind of do that in, in a proper way. I have no idea how I'm talking for. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm good. You're done, you're done. I'm pretty much done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it should be good. <laughs> Uh, Ethical was the name of uh, actually a project team here at PwC, um, where we were trying to come up with uh, solutions uh, for uh, yeah at the, at the intersection of ethics and, uh, and AI. And we wouldn't be good designers to really start trying to understand uh, the problem. So uh, we actually started with a community method and exercise where we did research, talked to a lot of experts, uh, etc. We identified. 11 trends and opportunities that ultimately we use for our program. Um, for today, we picked four of them that, yeah, that we thought would be most relevant for, uh, for the topic of today. And two of these that arose. And I hope you have six on the discussion. Um, the first trend that we uh, identified was that, um, well, basically, there's a big hype, and the chat GPT is uh, yeah, yet another example of it, and, uh, and a big one. Um, and there's sort of two components to it. There. There's one narrative that talks about all the amazing things that AI will achieve for us. You know, all kinds of diseases that are going to make the world much, much better and solve all these problems. Or, on the other hand, there are a lot of horror stories about how AI can uh, really uh, yeah, mess things up. And... Um, the problem is, in a way, that it sort of distracts from what's really going on, which is that AI is really there. It's embedded in a lot of digital experiences that people experience day to day, whether it's when you book your travel, or when you when you do your Google search, or when you uh, chat with uh, with a company. In all those instances, AI is already there, <coughs> and people, the public, is not really aware of that. They're still in either in La La Land or in horror. <laughs> In order for AI and ethics to truly come together and become actionable, um, we have to make ethics visible, visible in everyday experiences. So actually, the, the user has the voice at the table and knows what's going on. And also for your ex, um, you know, there are all kinds of design conventions that we just got used to about how, how the buy button works or how, how, how people, how to get people to click to another page or whatnot. But for, with regards to the design language for uh, your, your ex extended for AI, that doesn't really exist yet. And many, many more. So these are some opportunities that uh, yeah, we go to this trend. Um, the next one, oh yeah, the blurry boundaries. Um, we talk a lot about AI, but is that actually really, really what it's truly about? Because a digital experience, sure, it has AI in it, yes, but it also has known AI technology. And actually, there's also people involved who, who create that experience. And those are just Blurring and blending in together. And um, what you can say is that um, aside from a definition of, well, actually, what is AI then, or what is, what is ethics then, we really have to think more about um, how, yeah, how, is, how are we really going to apply ethics beyond even what legally is available, but what are really truly our ethics as a company? What do we stand for? And how does it follow through? Our entire experience, and if we ever do so, you have to think about about governance and how you make decisions. So, how might you assess experiences holistically and set ethical principles that uh, will be both relevant for AI but also for the non-AI elements? Those are different things, right? For AI, you may look for maybe explainability or fairness, but there are other ethical topics as well that go way beyond AI, but they are equally important: like data privacy or security. Um, and another one, also really important, how might we align a multidisciplinary team so that ethics become a driving force and not an afterthought? Because currently, what we've seen is that often what happens is that maybe the data scientists tend to have to make ethical decisions on their own, and then this perpetuates, maybe afterward people will raise the flag. Maybe as a designer, you have to make a decision. I'm sure you do people, you do your best, but you know. There is no, uh, maybe one designer makes a different decision than somebody else. So how do you get those in place? All right. Bless you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's nice. So 
water on the way. <laughs> and the next one we call automation, augmentation, and alienation. Um, well, I think some probably sounds familiar, and for some of you, maybe even something that's on your mind, like AI is going to change the workforce, right? It may, on the one hand, uh, disrupt jobs, it may create new jobs, it may change jobs. Uh, there's a lot going on there. And um, where traditionally, it was really low skilled jobs that people were talking about uh, being disrupted. Now it's also, uh, you know, there's discussions about what this what study going to mean for me as a designer, or what is GitHub going to mean for me as a software engineer. And even white collar jobs are, are being affected. As a conversationalist, I'm sure, thinking about, about that. Um, ultimately, um, of course, just a tool that can help us. So, and this is an open question to be figured out, but how might we use AI to create a process? What's the role? You know, I think the role, I mean, a lot of people are probably experimenting with that. Um, and how might we ensure that humans and machines are actually going to use UI, working together in a healthy way? And uh, what's that going to look like? I think, yeah, we're in the middle of figuring that out, but that's a really, really uh, important. One. And the last one that we thought was interesting for uh, tonight was uh, technology changes ethics. And we tend to think of ethics of this, yeah, this universal truth that's carved in in marble. Like right? this is this is these are ethics, and now let's push them through in our experience. But what you see, actually in history, you see it all the time. But actually, technology is a big driving force of changing ethics because it gives people an alternative option that's better. Like already in the early 1900s, they were talking about climate change. That's not a new topic. However, using coal remains an ethical behavior for many, many decades afterwards because there was no alternative until new alternatives came, and then that's when it shifted. It's the same with uh, with AI. So a lot of values. That, that we think are fixed are, are going to be in flux because when te technology accelerates, so will ethics. Think about sustainability, that's a really big topic. Um, the technology will influence. And all welfare, um, creativity, what's creative, what's man, what's machine, <coughs> synthetic biology. I won't go into that, that one now, but that's a massive field where uh, if AI helps with actually, there's, there's work in that with. Uh, artificial wounds and all the kind of stuff also that affects maybe how people think about uh, uh, about abortions, you know? So it really affects ethics. Uh, privacy, but a really, really big one that's particularly important uh, could be <coughs> long term thinking. You know, because values are changing uh, and we're building systems that, that may have to last for a long time, um, what do we know what the values are going to be in 10 years or maybe 50 years? Um, a lot of these autonomy and control. What, what do we feel comfortable handing over to the machine? What do we want to control? So these are all the progress, all the based on all those topics. So how might you consider future generations when formulating um, yeah, AI policies um, to better future proof of the building? And how about be sure that regulations continue to change at the speed of uh, change in ethics? Um, so these are just four. Uh, we have many, many more. Um, but yeah. Um, Looking forward to a discussion about this. So, um, I think everyone can come now to the center. We have to take a seat and open up the discussion. So, grab some water if you like. And um, you can see the first question is actually here on the right. And, um, we tried, I mean, we've heard now different information from different experts on the topic, and we try to, with some questions, to break a little bit down also what it means for us as UX professionals, because that's actually what we are mostly in here. And um, we have to talk about this hype, this chat GPT hype that is around uh, everywhere. So the question is more like, of course, on social media, there's a lot of positive, negative, it's mostly emotional reactions. The question would be, what kind of discussion should we have as UX professionals when it comes to this change? What's your opinion about that? Can you do AI in general? Let's, let's just start with chat GPT. We can uh, later on move on to AI in general. Who wants to start? <laughs> 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 
sure, I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. No, so I think that because it, it's it's really cool. Like, and I think 20, 30 years from now, everybody's gonna be like, oh, where were you when you saw that thing for the first time? Yeah. We have no idea what it is. I think that's the interesting part. So I think if your UX design, like every product that exists, is gonna like you're gonna have this large language model supporting it and it's gonna be part of it. You're gonna increase productivity. If you're UX designer now, you need some ideas, you give it a prompt, you might get much many more ideas than you would have previously. So I think there's like in your current workflow that you need to generate pictures and stuff like that. It's increasing productivity. But I think the main thing is that we have no idea what this is. And it's a little bit like when the app store launched and people are like, oh, well, we can create an app for a smartphone. And that's really cool. And then um, people would make like a to do with their calendar. And those are like the first apps that people create. Um, but we have no idea that you would get like an Uber or an Airbnb and then companies that would build as apps and that would take over the world. So I think right now it's a similar situation. Like, it's like we're building computers for chat GPT. And uh, there's some kid in the basement right now that's like 15 years old, and he's going to change the world with this in a way that we have no idea what that is. So I think that's kind of cool and, and interesting. So as a UX designer, I think what you need to do is like just get familiarize yourself with what this is, how it improves what you're doing, how you can like use that. Don't overcommit to it, but at least be educated because. Wherever you're going to work, there's going to be some person that's like, really, hey, can't we just do that with AI? Like, isn't that easier? So I think it's just being able to have enough knowledge about all of this, and being able to articulate that, and have conversations about that, and keep in mind on that. I think it's the most important thing to do. That's why that was really fun. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and building on that, maybe we can learn from what uh, went wrong in the first round of the app the world, right? Where a, a lot of these apps, like where Airbnb started off as we're going to change the world, we're going to give uh, uh, you know, uh, income uh, to people, and then kind of all, you know, uh, Uber driver <laughs> stand uh, in the social ladder. So, I mean, I think that that culture of startups that was really like paid fast, great things, obviously created a lot of interesting new services, but again, created a lot of uh, consequences for a lot of people. So maybe we can learn from that and apply a bit more of a mindful approach to the way that we can work with AI going forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think I mentioned this uh, in uh, my discussion before uh, before school, but uh, and the way I currently look at it is like it's this, this intern and you only credit you know, resume, uh, but you're still a little bit hesitant, like what can it actually do? So you can use it to bounce ideas off of and, you know, have some interesting discussions, but you should always check their work before actually, you know, sending it off. And, and, and to me, that, that's the stage where it's at right now. It's kind of unpredictable. Uh, we don't really know where it actually starts failing. Uh, this is part of the research that I'm currently also working on to uh, systematically um, um, you know, check for hypotheses of where it might start to break and then see when you can actually produce those, those fails and how you can then circumvent them by uh, adding different like, forms or by yeah, checking for certain errors that might occur. Um, so yeah, just be wise in using it, but definitely don't refrain from it because every experience that we can now gather from you know, wise people who are actually trying to understand the, uh, the technology and also share their experiences with one another, that's going to help us to be more responsible in using it. You know, we have to understand that it's definitely technology that will fail in the answer. What would you say, like, if, um, in the workplace, because I'm a content designer, so for me it's been relevant, so I'm working. I just see it as a tool. But if somebody comes in the company and says like, oh, well, I'm not going to hire any more any writers, what, what's your advice? What, what is the, the good answer to this, this kind of question? Because I'm sure it's going to come up because people that are not writing think like, well, it's going to solve all the problems now with writing. 
mean, it's the same as um, uh, just creating a lot of products of the same uh, kind. At a certain point, you will lose your unique selling point by doing something that any other person that has access to technology can also create. So, um, yeah, definitely there's going to be like uh, people who are just going to produce a lot of crap in a very, <laughs> yeah, in a very small amount of time by uh, using these kinds of applications. But at a certain point in time, that quality uh, will also be very much reduced and people will always start looking for high quality things. Um, things that are meaningful and yeah, also hiring someone who can just you know click a button and you can find those people anywhere, right? So also as a professional, I think you know you still need to take some pride in what you're doing and you try to add that extra touch that only you can. So yeah, to me, I don't think it's going to be from the long run. No, otherwise we're going to have only one time of life. Yeah, so that's a problem. I guess it's like mediocre of professionals, they will be automated, so the actual yeah. runs will go at a premium, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So do your job well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a simple, simple stuff, yeah. like um, uh, translating, I don't know, like uh, yeah, descriptions of products in your web shop. I don't know. I'm not a <laughs> Um, yeah, so I can imagine that some things you can probably get very well because there's no good education and other things you want to have your own yeah, special brand or special sort of brand. Yeah, I mean, let's say emails. Like, if AI is taking over the, the things that we don't like to do, that's great. And we just do the art. That's actually, that would be actually a, a great uh, solution, I think. Um, I don't know, how is court? PwC, are you using it? AI in general? Like um, using it? Great company. I don't know exactly what it's doing yet. Mm -hmm. I think other, other, other people are experimenting with it and trying to figure out. You know, I don't think we actually have the better people. And I also think the question is also what should the discussion really be about. And I think in a way it's also a little bit like managing expectations, right? Because remember, I showed that the high the high trend is sort of that that we clearly in a high right now, right? If people are like, oh, the that we could use for change, all those things, it's gonna browse all the copy or whatever amazing or terrible things you will achieve, you know, and it's sort of like, well, you know, if you want out of many and we'll see where it goes. Uh, the <coughs> expectations also when clients come to you, like, hey, at least sometimes and I am actually now sometimes where it's being thrown in there, you know, like uh, let's use AI and then somehow <laughs> <laughs> So that's actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's uh, that's good one, right? And still, a little bit like you know, maybe focus a little bit more on what we call the boring AI. Yeah. You know, there's the AI in a lot of things already. Uh, so, uh, like it's made, you know, so like in all kinds of other systems, where it's actually super, super useful. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not like there's one big AI. I think right. A lot of people's misconception: there's not a thing like a the AI, right? <laughs> there's like super laser, narrowly scoped AI that's effective. But you already mentioned some challenges also coming up with AI. So what would you say are the new challenges for us as US professionals? Okay, I've heard we have to learn how to, to mm. use it, but um what are challenges we, we gonna face? And what kind of decisions we have to make then? Maybe a lot. <laughs> intellectual property, maybe uh, policies that we have to adopt. Uh, God, uh, in general. Um, oh, maybe also like striking the balance between, I you call it efficacy, like the beautiful thing you can create with AI and then the ethics of it. You know, typically when you're in an innovative mind, you're just focusing on what you can do with it. Yeah. Um, so. Um, and I think application is one, right? To make it better ready. Um, um, practical things, you don't know how to write a good song. But that's something that I've, I've been playing a little bit. Uh, and last, yesterday, I couldn't get any sessions to play more. But um, no, it's, it's, it's funny how, 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 how massively different it is what you get at the time of the week. So maybe that's going to be one of 
Do you, do you would feel that too? Yeah. yeah, it's like when Google arrived, right? I remember sitting in front of my browser and say, okay, so what do I write on this <laughs> white box? You know, but we learn how to write search queries, so we can learn how to use AI as well. Yeah, exactly, how to breathe AI. But as a challenge, they really like the so what Monica was saying before, as you ask the professionals, so being able to explain what AI is, because it is indeed misconceived as one big black box. And we have an opportunity to bridge that gap. And I think uh, that's what design uh, profession is about, right? Is to create this connection between technology and people. And uh, I think that's a very good <coughs> thing. Um, so how do you see that, uh, like practical speaking, like becoming a company that I'm, I'm like kind of the connector between, or? Well, you need to apply principles of uh, consent by design, or privacy by design, uh, safety by design, you know, so that's uh, uh, designing the whole experience and not just the piece of technology that generates stuff. It's, uh, it's the whole frame where that technology plays a role that's relevant, and that's where we can uh, have that advantage. So you mean like being critical also? Being critical and being transparent, you know, and being able to translate something that is highly technical and complicated for really anybody to understand, you know, accessible. Yeah. And what would you say uh, is the role of AI in creative? Well, yeah, I read the question. I was like, okay, what is the creative process? It's yeah. something that's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but many people try to research what the creativity entails and what are the different steps of creativity and uh, most of them pay. But if you can assume that there are certain ingredients like uh, inspiration, exploration, selection, and fine tuning, well, yeah, I can help you in any of these steps uh, and depending a lot on your creative process it can add a lot of value it can also add a lot of noise you know i can totally see designers getting lost in front of their computer just keeping on playing with it uh, forever right and yes. copyright and the stuff yes is now actually creating whole new branches within art that are uh, using um, uh, generative images uh, to create new yeah, art forms, basically. Um, it's almost like photography ruining uh, a painting or something, right? I mean, it's, it's both there. It's just different forms of art. That doesn't mean that one will replace the other. It's yeah. like more possibilities and more... Uh, tools that we can use to create new things. So, yeah. interesting to think about because create what is creativity like? Right? So, the question yeah. that I, at least how, how I tend to see it, I think it's basically about connecting dots, you know, like it's there we can make new combinations. Uh, that's of course something that uh, yeah, I say good at, yeah. depending on what input you give it. But maybe we get a new definition of creativity, or maybe go to the original. Definition of the like, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. That was also never used, right? So, well, but that's the thing, like, yeah, but that's the thing. But I think ultimately, we just, I, I think that you want the information to be unique for, for us. Like, you get you started when you start with something, you know, maybe a few perspectives, or and then you can get that like, going. But yeah, I don't know where it's going to end because aren't they saying that now the people are trying to get movie scripts and then also. Oh, you can try the movies already. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't think that's there, but then, well, right, maybe they use some now. I mean, somebody will in the next couple of years actually publish an AI creative movie. That's, no, yeah, yeah, right? And that's going to come out. And it's going to be any good? Yeah, I think it's going to be much better than we would want it to be. Yeah, I'm not going to see the dissing it now, you know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they have AI influencers, those are also nice, where you're going to have, like, where you can only have avatars with all personalities, and they're just cool. They already have that in Korea. They're going to see that all over the place. So that's just so nice. But creating those kinds of things for themselves and then profit shares. 
yeah. Um, yeah, I'm blessed, yes. I also heard the other, uh, yesterday, it was kind of fun because it was like with the imagery art. I was like, okay, so it's looking at art created by people, and that is just, you know, mixes it up and creates new art, and then it's about the ownership and the IP of the original stuff, right? So that is also a very interesting thing happening. But if I want to be like a very good painter, I want to be a good writer, I want to be the writer, the writer is like, I read like thousand books, and I write a lot, and I'm also just taking from that, right? In a way, I'm also an AI taking everything that I've ever seen and applying yeah. it and then yeah. passing it off as well. But like, everything that we're saying, we probably found on YouTube one day and read by an article suggestions. Yeah, but indeed, I mean, AI is an amplifier, right? Yeah. But it's also an amplifier of all our mistakes, of our yeah. biases, right? So if you say, for example, let's build an AI that builds interfaces, it builds the US. Well, it's going to go and look at uh, the first million websites uh, in terms of visitors in the, in the world, and 80% of them are inaccessible. Mm. It's a fact. Mm. So what is it going to learn? To be an inaccessible website, mm. right? So we need to understand that if AI is learning from us, with all the good and the bad that we bring that ability to um, go and um, curate its own data set. And I think that's what people can do, right? We can have an opinion about the quality of some experience that we have, or some uh, example that we have, and we can try and find the best examples and kind of create <coughs> all those that we don't like. So, and that is something that AI at the moment is can do. Uh, relying on the information that we give it, and it can also distinguish between good and bad examples, and doesn't have an opinion about any of it, doesn't actively search for additional examples. So, I think that's a big, big difference in what you just described that people also kind of crowdsourcing everything that they know. That's true, uh, but we do it in a much more direct fashion, I think, much more intentional. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing, though. It's like if you know, we're kind of at this early stage of AI, right? It's going to be here for another thousand years possible. Um, so now it's like the values that you lock in. It's like we've got all these smart people here that are thinking like, ah, we should actually think about what kind of data we give it and how we curate it. And because, you know, what we give the AI, it gives back to us and then we give that back. So we could turn this into a positive spiral thing. With the values that we lock in, or we can have it trained on Reddit and inaccessible websites, <laughs> and then we as people also become more evil because of people as well. Right? <laughs> so I think you're also thinking that the long term we're going to the same for a right? yeah. So, yeah, so that's the interesting part. It's like it feels like this is taking off now, but we might have enough smart people in the world now to say, you know, let's maybe think about this a little bit better. So, that is just going to take off. Yeah, but it's a, it's a matter of quantity versus so quality, right? Yeah. So that distinction we can do, and uh, AI can't uh, either. And also, because there isn't necessarily anything that is 100% good or 100% bad, you know, it depends on the context, on uh, the situation, you know. So there isn't an absolute truth, and that's a problem with AI and technology in general. Scale, you know, it's the fact that we need to build something that is good or it's working for everybody and nothing works for everybody by definition right so what what should we do about it uh, should we keep on uh, kind of uh, uh, hammering it uh, the, the, uh, the majority one uh, onto the minority should we break it down should we think again how we can add value in different but if I understand correctly I mean our work will change that's for sure. So anyway, we have to learn continuously because technology is changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice in what should we learn? And what kind of skills do we need? Because when I'm thinking of my work, I use a lot of tools. And writing has become, well, has always been like a small part of the work, but I have all these tools and it's not that I'm faster, it's just different. Yeah. So, what 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 do we need to learn? Well, 
when I started working in this space, you were talking about new media. So my job has changed consistently, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like every few months. So I mean, changes are constant of people working, especially in the digital space. So I don't think that is a new per se. And what it is, let's say, what is increasing is the amount of tools, the amount of noise, the amount of information, and there the skill that you need the most is a critical sense of discerning, you know, this wide amount of things that there are and understanding exactly what is useful when. So for me, the most important skill is the critical stance, but also um, recognizing the power that we hold in designing and developing uh, digital applications and to relinquish and distribute that power. Uh, and design with the people that are going to be working with the by itself. But for me, those are the most important skills. The more powerful the tools we have, the more responsibility we have uh, to take uh, that role. Well, I mean, critical sense is something that we all, like, we all learn at school. So I don't mean, like, that's not something new. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> so perhaps I, I don't see that something. Oh wow! Yes. So let's get a LinkedIn learning course on how to become critical, or I don't know. Yeah. Well, for me, um, we learn a lot of shallow skills as well <laughs> in our profession, like a lot, a lot of skills that were told like this is gonna save your career or whatever. You know, and uh, uh, I've seen them coming and going. <coughs> so, yeah, well, there isn't a LinkedIn course. LinkedIn course is not necessarily the, <laughs> the store that I would go for. Uh, but there is plenty of uh, critique and plenty of work done by very serious uh, writers and authors uh, on uh, responsibility and uh, the role of the power of design. So, I really think not to appeal uh, yeah. Any other um, opinions on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of in the, yeah, the same thing. Like, the unique and human skills that really separate this is collaboration. You know, with, uh, if you don't have to work together with all the systems, you can all the but also the user. Um, yeah, and the critical thinking is still part of that, and ethics is a part of that. But really, the unique and human thing that, that makes you stand out because that's what it's been used to do. So, how do you separate it? So I would like to uh, touch on one topic that we haven't talked really a lot, it's about ethics. So and after that, I would like to open up the discussion so you can all uh, ask questions um, because we're running over time. Um, there's a lot to talk about. So how can we design for good or responsible in your eyes, thinking of all the new challenges we have to face? So it's a big question, so that's why it's also kind of my end question that is opening up a lot of more questions yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, for me uh, there's a big difference between uh, ai for good and responsible ai and i think it's oftentimes mixed uh, and people will say okay we're working on AI for good we're using it for these super nice uh, um, uh, impacts and intentions uh, but even if you're using AI to, uh, for instance, bring education to people in, I don't know, rural areas where it's very difficult to go to school, uh, if you're not respecting their privacy or if you're uh, not explaining to them uh, how you make the decisions of who gets the uh, user tool and who doesn't, or if you're using some weird business model that makes it only accessible to uh, uh, people who uh, have money, for instance, and uh, then, then it might be AI for good, but you're still not doing it responsibly. So there's a very big difference between those two things, and yeah, it's very a big challenge to hit the mark on both, I think. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes me think of, uh, and as a robotics company, and they, they put robots in the house uh, <coughs> over adults to keep them company, there's more and more, which is really nice. 
and then they can play games and they talk, they chat all day. But then, like when somebody, let's say someone says, you know, it's like, How, how's your day been? And then you say, well, I'm really lonely and I'm really depressed. Maybe somebody says that to a robot. Now, these people do not know that in Tel Aviv, there's like 10 people and they're reading the transcripts because they're trying to make the product better, <laughs> right? So there's already an ethical concern there. Should they know that? Because it also kind of ruins the experience because it's a companion. But the people that now read that, do they have the responsibility to call the doctor and be like, we think there's something going down there, we should check in on that. All right, so there's like a very interesting loop around ethics. So there's, a, there's an additional question that you could ask. Uh, now that there's a robot with this person, do other people feel less obliged to go visit? That's because not, they're like, oh, but now that's a robot. So if yeah. I don't go tonight, at least they're not. No, that's also a sign of that. So, yeah, there are also these unintentional effects that sometimes arise that you will only find when you start actually testing it uh, in reality. And you need to think about the potential positive impact, but also the potential negative impact and formulate hypotheses about both and test them both to find out, like, okay, what, what am I actually contributing to? Because if you only look at the benefits, right, then uh, you can... Post those off, maybe you can maybe um, uh, uh, say, okay, the hypothesis all came true. But if there are actually a lot of uh, negative side effects that also came true, you should check for them. And the outcomes might, you know, um, uh, some up more negative than. Uh, and if we don't have an ethical responsibility to want to share more, we don't have a nice profit. Right? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a whole different thing. That's more the thing. Ethical AI being the end of capitalism. Yeah. That's also yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's like, you need to be though. It's about having the ethics and the creative force, you know, to really solve those difficult problems that are really not really solvable. I mean, I think that's too far of the vision, but then in the how, it's a definitely right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, uh, professionals and designers that come to me and really like want to learn how to do better things because they do see the issues. But and my initial response is start from yourself, start from looking at your own bias at your own blind spots, I call it the ableist term, but uh, really for uh, understanding what is it that you are missing. Um, which tools you're using, which methodologies are you using, what are, are those tools, who does it do, and how is your team, you know, is it diverse enough, is it uh, reflecting the, the world that is out there, you know, those are the things that we need to look into. I often ask our participants to share their experts. Um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand and just, yep, ask um, a question. I'm not in the US, but I think AI is going into all kinds of different industries now, right? And I'm just wondering, where do you think the responsibility and the ethics lie? Like, if it's all across these different industries and, of course, all across different contexts, right? And I guess you said it's in a context to be dependent. Do you think it comes from government? Do you think it comes from industry? Do you think it comes from like personal designers? Do you think we even have time to think about the ethics? And sometimes we just have to get them down. So where do you think the guidelines around ethics should come from? It's almost like asking who's responsible for traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone basically they all have their part to play. So yeah, it's, it's very systemic. Uh, yeah, and that makes it very <laughs> complex to think about all these parts and you know, build each other up and not you know, undermine one another. And, you know. I think that's why you have to bring all the parts together. And the collaboration is going to be very important. I mean, I think government, I mean, I, I'm forgetting the AI Act, and so that doesn't mean push here, but I think typically what you see is that rule, the regulations are always after. Right? So that's always going to follow whatever happens. In the marketplace, and so I think as an organization, we probably will have to 
uh, take the initiative. And in a way, it really comes also comes down to like, what are your values as a company? Maybe different for different companies. So they, these stakeholders will have to have that discussion with each other and, uh, and their clients or whatever they are. Um, in a discussion to figure it out. I do not think it should be the sole responsibility for the designer or the developer. Even though in reality, currently, that's often where just by default lies because they're the ones who are dealing with it and doing the best guess. I don't think that that's moving forward from either way. Expensive, going to error from even different decisions, you know, with an A to B. But the traffic is uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the end, we were going to have a lot of accidents, and there is some regulation <laughs> like we need to know how to drive. So, um, yeah, yeah, you can improve the cars and mm -hmm. implement seatbelts, and you know, you start yeah. guiding people for driving the road. And there, there's a lot of different things that we need put in place yeah. to make sure that it's safe. And, and yeah, probably we'll learn a lot about where accidents occur and what kind of general rules are supposed to be signed. So there is by driving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, first, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you know, you know, in cars for life. So there is uh, a lot of rules and a lot of safety measures either. So, really good question. Thank you. Somebody else in the room would like to ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, my voice is a little shaky, but uh, I wanted to ask you in our organization when we we're trying to build AI powered features, tools, and so on. And there is this big um, misconception of the responsibility involved in doing these things that we were talking about. Do you have any advice uh, or things that you tried to do in the past with your clients to help them understand the responsibility they hold in designing and building these things? In a way that, yeah, trying to avoid the dramatic end or giving them examples of how it could go wrong, because then when that happens, they just switch off and ignore any advice. So, we will see them try that work well for you. Um, usually, with words, uh, like uh, regulation and compliance is a very good place to start. Mm -hmm. The AI Act specifically is giving some guidance. So, Usually compliance is the very first little step. Uh, although if a uh, board is not interested, it's gonna be a part of that anyway, right? So um, you can't come in from other than the point of view of things. It's very important to set the building rule. But uh, there is a lot of movement in the market. So usually you'll see some more competitors are doing regulations uh, together, you know, the totally systemic perspective um, can help, and sometimes it can help also if a lot of employees are convinced about something and want to raise uh, a point with uh, with their board. So all of that together. Mm -hmm. yeah, like you just mentioned, open times now, because there's nothing in place, uh, the developers and designers are basically making decisions that they feel they cannot have or yeah, carry the full responsibility for because it should be something that, that is covered by the organizational level. You don't want to do it on a personal condo. So um, then they start pushing, oh, like, hello, give us a framework or some guidance or yeah, cover our asses, basically, <laughs> uh, so that we are the ones who have to make these tough decisions because that's not our thing. So. And we often need some, some person who, who wants to take it on to, yeah. to shake it up as ethics evangelist. And it could, it could come from anywhere, mm -hmm. from a particular job title or role. You know, mm -hmm. like, like a board example, you know, without somebody who is willing to take on that role, you're not going to get those guys. It should be a job, shouldn't it be a job? Like, for well, you know, it's going to be a great role to have. Or even the people, that's also something that you see. People stand up and start doing things and start shaking things up, and then the company thinks, oh, okay, we'll, we'll just give you that role and we can make it happen. Mm -hmm. so, a lot of people just shit and then we go home for the weekend, right? And that's mm -hmm. the reality. Uh, I think so. Yeah. There was somebody who. Here, uh, raise the hand. Uh, 
Oh no, yeah, that was me. But um, it was more a comment about ethics because um, for me, ethics is not something that has um, at the universal level like um, a goal to prove it's a discipline to preserve common good. So outside of AI, it has a macro uh, purpose as well as a micro purpose, and we all individually like responsible for the for the decision we're making on a daily basis, which, you know, yeah. So, and I asked, um, but the thing it was more with the previous conversation and I forgot the thing, so now I didn't want to talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, you look at like spiral dynamics when you go through that people are kind of like developing as a whole, right? Uh, you look at how people were in the Middle Ages and become more like, more empathy, more compassion. So in a way to create your AI, all you need to do is also create better people in a way, right? So we're talking very much of like <laughs> what are the steps that I need to take to do this now and do that. But there is kind of like this there's almost people revolution in the world now where people are more connected with each other, they're looking for those things. If you think about like what the first part is possible, you know, like how do I want to be a good driver myself? I think it's like you see that trends if you look at like the past decade, you see that more and more happening. But yeah, AI just developed so much faster than that, right? But it's it's yeah, these two things are both going up and they play into each other. So, I think uh, we take one last question, uh, kind of so on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, thank you so very much. Yes, it's it's there, yeah. quite a lot of different time. Yeah, but there's this one more question yeah, yeah. here. Actually, I have two. Can you can answer just one if it's special? So, um, we see the now that conversational AI has passed the very fast. And in the past, like in the past decade, so it was supposed to be like the ultimate task for conversational AI. So right now, like what's next? Like is there like a new standard or a new task for that? That's the first one. And second one is kind of what is your experience or opinion about um, training an AI model with um, AI generated training data? <laughs> well, so the Turing test is kind of interesting, right? Because it's, I think the goal of conversational AI is not to be as human possible. The goal of conversational AI is to use elements of natural language to help people achieve their goals. And they're very different, right? So we don't try to pretend to be people. Um, and then in the Turing test, like, it's not that difficult like to pass the Turing test. There's been a lot of research where people have been doing like uh, the, the sex robot is the most common trick for this because it's very easy to convince a man that he's talking to a real <laughs> being well, very clearly a robot, but it's just because he's horny. And it's, it's a very simple thing of how that has been manipulated. Right? So the Turing test in and of itself, it, it's a fun gimmicky thing. But uh, conversational AI does not necessarily have the goal of passing it and trying to do that going with or the most natural thing. And uh, yeah, and the test itself is yeah, it's more like a nice research thing. I don't think it doesn't necessarily impact so far. And training it with synthetic data, you know, I guess totally fine. But like mm -hmm. again, you know, there's been enough diversity in that data as well because if you're just creating it based on a very small subset that's not relevant to the audience, then yeah, you're not doing a good job. But if it is broad and diverse, you might want to amplify it to the data and change the model. I think that's okay. But yeah, that was a great question. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I think we have come to an end, and I think Candice, you want to say uh, do something before we. Well, I wanted to close. Yeah. I wanted to th uh, thank uh, Caroline, who wasn't able to make it, so she, she was supposed to come. She was a backup uh, panelist, um, and I wanted to give her a little gift, but she ended up not coming just in the nick of time. And I wanted to thank Kurt and his amazing team for having us here tonight, and all of you for coming up and showing up, and uh, please join the Randstad UX and pay to do this every month. 